My name is uh, Kirk Keller Halls, Vietnamese American, born during the Vietnam War, and I am the executive producer and director for the Intersections Docu series that highlights the stories of Amerasians and adoptees like me and those that help form their lives. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over. Thank you for coming on, Kirk. Thank you. Can you tell me a little bit about your journey leaving Vietnam as a baby? Well, I was born during the, uh, the height of the war in 1969 in Da Nang in the summertime. And uh, right after my birth, I had learned that my uh, would have been my grandfather, my mother's father, had ordered his son, who would have been my uncle, to take me from uh, my mother and take me to the orphanage to be uh, given away because of the shame surrounding uh, the fact that she had had a relationship and had a child with a with a foreigner. So I ended up in the uh, orphanage right after I was born. I spent two and a half years there and uh, was adopted out by that army major and taken to the United States. And you were raised by this army major and his wife, presumably, or just him? Yeah, no, it was, it was him and his wife. Uh, they were told at the time that they couldn't have children, so they adopted me and another uh, Vietnamese girl who was an infant at the time uh, from Vietnam, so they could have kids of their own. Uh, so I was raised uh, by them. Uh, he was an Army, career Army officer, so I got the opportunity to travel all over the world wherever he was stationed and have those different experiences and cultures, so that was really cool growing up. But um, I grew up with a very loving family. It was a very um, solid family, and uh, I, honestly, I grew up with more privileges and opportunities than probably most kids my age, so I was very grateful for that. And when along the road of growing up did you find out that you were an adoptee? Don't know the exact age, but I would say it was during elementary school because uh, you know how, how brutal kids can be when it comes to seeing people that look different. And it's not so much that I look different. It was that when my parents would come pick me up or my family would attend different school functions, it was pretty obvious that I was adopted. Uh, my adoptive father was uh, has a German background, and my adoptive mother has an Irish background. And after adopting me, they actually had ended up having a couple of daughters of their own with blonde hair and blue eyes. So it was pretty obvious <laughs> that I didn't belong to this family. So I can remember in elementary school uh, getting asked about that, getting teased about it, and, and just finally one day asking, you know, my parents, how come I look different, or you know, how come they're telling me that I'm not a part of this family? What was their response? Well, the response was, uh, well, I, I remember asking my father um, very, very, very pointedly about it. Um, you know, why did I end up in the orphanage? And the response he had given me was, well, we're not sure, but it is assumed because of the war that your mother and father were killed during the war. And that you, That's why you're in the orphanage. Uh, but they never, ever said anything in regards to um, the lack of biological connection. It was just the fact that I ended up in a loving family and being raised as I was one one of their own. So I don't know. Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. But how, <laughs> okay. how long does that go on for that? You know, a very benign story that they were killed in yeah, the war yeah. and it just keeps going and perpetuating. But at some point things probably start to flip, right? Yeah. Um, believe it or not, that whole mindset and that whole feeling of feeling different from not only being adopted, but being adopted from a region in a time frame that was not very popular in history. Uh, that followed me and shadowed me into my adulthood. Um, I can remember, you know, when I started realizing that I was different and that I wasn't um, like the other kids, and they would find out at a very early age, they would find out, um, you know, I would tell them when I was in elementary school, well, I'm from Vietnam. Um, I started getting called all sorts of names, and at first I didn't realize they were poking fun at me. They, they nicknamed me Charlie. I just thought that was a cool American name. I uh, didn't realize what they were talking about, and it, you know, it did take long <laughs> to figure out that they weren't being nice. They were being very, very um, derogatory. So it, I quickly learned in elementary school that identifying anything that has to do with Vietnam and the Vietnam War and coming out of Vietnam, especially being adopted, uh, put me on the put me on the firing range quite a bit with these young kids. So I can I can tell you right now, honestly, for the better part of my um, elementary school. Middle school, even part of my high school, I denied being half Vietnamese. I denied my heritage. I denied my ethnicity. Um, it's, it's kind of funny because I would claim the ethnicity of whatever was popular at the time. Because uh, I can remember going through elementary school, the big popular thing back then, the TV show was Chips. You know, Eric Estrada and Chips. And I knew he was Latino, so I would 
you know, claimed to be half half Mexican or half Latino, uh, thinking that was cool. Uh, and I can remember going into middle school and moving to Texas. And uh, as you can imagine, with, with Texas and, and the South in general having, you know, there's a population that is very derogatory towards Hispanics and Mexicans. All of a sudden, I started being called all these racist names about being Spanish. So as luck would have it, there was an English teacher I had who was half, actually, he was Italian. Of course, he was the cool guy in school. Everyone loved him. So I started identifying as half Italian. <laughs> so I just identified with, you know, my other half with whatever was popular at the time, whatever I thought would, you know, make me be accepted. Um, it wasn't until I was in high school, and it's it, it's kind of funny because I went to high school at Seoul American High School in Korea. Uh, that's where, where my father was stationed at the time. My last two years of high school were spent there, and for the first time, I wasn't in a school that was primarily Caucasian. It was very, 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 very much a mixed bag. It was on base, but it was still uh, flooded with Amerasians, you know, Korean Amerasians, Japanese Amerasians, and for the first time in my life, I actually felt comfortable in my skin and being able to admit, yeah, I'm, 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 half, I'm half Vietnamese. And for the first time in my life, my junior year, I wasn't getting teased about it. Uh, so that, that that was a pretty good feeling to be able to put that on the front. But into my adulthood, I was kind of telling you, kind of, this kind of blew over into my adulthood. Um, out of high school, I went into law enforcement. Uh, and I served as a law enforcement officer in Tennessee for the better part of 12 years. And it was kind of a shock to me whenever I started. And I found out that some of the veteran officers that I was working with were Vietnam veterans. Uh, and some of them had really rough experience over there. God only knows what they witnessed, what they saw. But when they found out that I was half Vietnamese, a couple of them immediately took a dislike to me and very openly was very racist about it, very derogatory about it. Uh, so I found myself, you know, as a young adult, as a young law enforcement officer in the South, facing, you know, these type of derogatory remarks and this type of racism that I really wasn't expecting after having come out of that whole atmosphere of being in high school and kind of just being able to let go of who I am. So I wouldn't say that I hid it and I didn't lie about it, but it wasn't something I advertised um, when, when, when I was a young adult. Before you got to Seoul and discovered there's this population of like half uh, Asian, half uh, white kids, and you were sort of perpetrating um, these fake identities, what would go through your mind as you were getting made fun of? Uh, as I think about that experience that you were perhaps going through. I mean, I can relate to that shame, but you took on a different approach, which is the Italian, the Latino. How did that feel when you were wearing these other hats? And, you know, I mean, this goes on for a few years at a time, posing as an Italian, posing as yeah. a, a Latino. How did Was it like something like you culturally embraced being a Latino, culturally embraced being an Italian? Or did you just say, you know what? I was just adopted. I don't know anything about it, but I happen to be half Italian. Yeah, it, it was the latter of the two because, you know, obviously when I was doing the whole, you know, chips and poncherello thing, I was too young to really embrace much of anything as far as culture. And quite honestly, there, there was a, quite a tinge of guilt there because to this day, I don't believe my adopted parents know I ever did that because it was something that I didn't disclose to them. It was something I didn't tell them because I did not want them to feel like, um, I was ashamed of them because I, I was never, ever ashamed of them. And so I felt guilty um, because I knew that I wasn't being honest with myself. I wasn't being honest with the people that knew me. But when asked about it, I never dealt, dove deep into it. I never gave details and they never asked. I just found out that if I would just claim being anything other than Vietnamese uh, because of the Vietnam War and everything attached to it, that people would leave me alone. So at the point when they left me alone, I just I, I never dug into it any further. Now, it sounds like you had a pretty happy childhood and they were great parents, but looking back, if you were in their shoes, what kinds of things would you do differently? And the reason I ask this is because there's uh, this whole, you know, movement in the adoption world to kind of move away from this idea of pulling out kids from their origin, countries of origin. Mm -hmm. But I don't fully agree with it and I don't fully I'm against it. I, I could see both perspectives, but there is a movement for not doing transnational adoption. What would sure, you sure. say to your parents, uh, or if you were in their shoes today, looking back, what would you, what, what could you have done differently to make your your life a little bit more understandable? Well, in order to answer that, I kind of have to understand and empathize with the position they were in. Not only was the Vietnam War 
you know, wrapping up and, and all the negative stuff that went along with it. My father fought in it. You know, he was in the army, boots on the ground, actively participating in this war. So for, for my family growing up, Vietnam was off limits. We didn't talk about Vietnam. We wow. didn't talk about the war. I remember asking a couple of times, I was very little, you know, you know, you know, for the lack of that, I can ask I remember saying, you know, how many people did you kill? And that was just one of those things that they didn't answer it. I wasn't allowed to talk about it. And I learned very, very early on that that was an off limit subject. So what I would change is uh, something that I've actually witnessed with other adoptees that I connected with, where their adoptive parents kept them very much familiar with the culture, wanted them to stay connected to Vietnam, wanted them to understand their roots and not only understand it and, and know where they came from, but be proud of it. Uh, there's one adoptee I met. It just blows my mind that by the time he got to be an adult and wanted to go back to Vietnam, his parents disclosed to him at that point that they'd been saving money all his life. Wow. Well, he wouldn't be an expense for him, and he didn't even have saved enough so they could go with him to experience what it was like to go back to Vietnam. So that's not saying that my parents did anything wrong. Please understand, I'm not saying they did anything wrong, but if, if I could trade places with them knowing what I know now and, and and do things differently, I'd do exactly kind of what I'm doing with my own kids right now, exposing them to the culture of Vietnam, the beauty of Vietnam. Uh, we... When I talk about Vietnam with my kids, we never talk about the war. They never ask about it. They're too young to remember. So that's one of those things where what has affected the perspective and, and the acceptance of the Vietnamese people and the Asians from Vietnam for so many decades is no longer a factor with the new generation. So that I think that's a blessing that I'm able to share that with my kids and someday my grandkids. But if I had to go back and, and, and ask my parents, can you do this differently? It would have been, let me be Vietnamese and be proud of it. I want to know everything about it because there's things about Vietnam that I never knew about. And I didn't find out until I went back to visit for the first time in my life ever since leaving in 2019. And my perspective, what I was expecting, the expectations of what I was expecting from Vietnam versus the reality when I got there was polar opposite. And what what and were you expecting? I was expecting to go over there and, and, and find a people that were cold, hateful, staring, government agents following us around, looking around, seeing buildings all in crumbles and just a country completely impoverished and brought to its knees. That's what I was expecting. But what I got over there, again, was the polar opposite of everything that I had known growing up with, seen in the movies and heard in stories. Uh, I, I can't get over there enough. I love that place. It, it's one of the most friendliest societies I've ever been in. It's beautiful. They build it back up. Uh, you have to look really hard to see any remnants of war. And, and as far as the government is concerned, I've you know I've gone over a couple of times to film over there. And this last time I went over to film with working with the foreign ministry, it, it was amazing. These people were so helpful and willing to share their culture and help us portray Vietnam in a different lens that people aren't used to seeing. So just being able to see all that firsthand has you know, has really motivated me to want to get these stories out there and, and go back as much as possible so that the shadow of the Vietnam War is no longer going to be over anybody. Because that's to me, that's, that's the biggest hangup with anyone having to do with Vietnam uh, fr from that era is just the shadow of the war kind of overshadowing everything that's good about it. Every Vietnamese person in America has to deal with that, whether they admit it or they don't admit it. Mm -hmm. We're living in the shadow of the war, and we're t I'm tired of it. I'm so mm -hmm. tired of this. I know it's a part of our legacy. I know it's a part of our history. But damn it, I'm just over it, and I just want to move on as the, we're just human beings. We're, yeah. We're, yeah. we're human beings that went through some trauma, and... Um, it's just time to like move on from that narrative, you know, especially in film and TV. Yeah. And, uh, but there are aspects of it that we must study, which is what you're talking about in intersections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you know, I was saying, if you don't uh, learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. So it's a very important part of our history. I get that. Um, but it's also important to be able to look at both sides of it, both perspectives. Cause I can tell you growing up, like I said, it's nothing, nothing against my, my, my upbringing, but, you know, I was growing up with that strong sense of patriotism, you know, serve your country, American can do no wrong. Um, that's why I went to law enforcement, because I wanted to serve my country and get back. I don't want to go in the military and have to be told where to live, but I went to law enforcement as a form of serving my country. But until you can get into that mind frame and get into that realistic idea of what it was like from both sides, um, it, it's it's hard to wrap your mind around it. This last time we were in Vietnam, this, um, this past January, we went to the the, uh, the memorial where the Miley massacre ha happened, you know, that's, that's a part of history that nobody wants to think about. Nobody wants to remember, but we don't have to, to dwell on it, but we have to remember things like that because it's a good reminder that in war, terrible things happen on both sides. 
in war, there's two perspectives. And unless you can step back and you can look back, look at both sides, right or wrong, doesn't matter, but be able to look at both perspectives and empathize with either, both sides are going through, I don't think there's ever going to be that stigma, especially where this war is concerned. I don't think that stigma is ever going to be lifted. But I think what we're doing through intersections with people sharing their stories about their upbringing, what it was like, um, it's even including some of the stories with with the veterans that actually visit us during, during the war, come to the orphanage and visit us as a reminder to them that they're still good in the country, that despite what they're seeing in the battlefields, despite what they're seeing, um, you know, in the trenches and the battlefields, that they're still good in that country. So being able to hear their stories and, and how it's been healing for them after 50 years to reconnect with us and see that the good that they saw in that country 50 years ago is still alive and well and doing better than they ever expected. Uh, that, that has been a healing process for these veterans that I never, ever expected. That's kind of a byproduct that I never planned on and never expected. But um, since we've seen it, we've decided that's going to be one of our focuses for, for the whole series is their stories and how it affects them and how the reconnections after 50 years is changing their perspective as well. So I want to segue real quick over to Ji Nguyen Phan Kui Mai, the author mm -hmm. of The Mountain Sing and her newest book, Dust Child. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. She does a great job of showing all sides. Very good job of jo showing all sides in a yeah. very balanced way, uh, almost journalistic, uh, infused uh, into some, you know, to fiction that's based on uh, real and inspired people mm -hmm. and events. How did you get in touch with her? And I know that you're on this book tour with her. Yeah. How did yeah. you meet her? And I want to hear your thoughts on Dust Child, the book. Sure, sure. Well, it's funny because the, the whole. The name of the series Inter intersections is called intersections because of lives intersecting people intersecting with one another and how it affects one another and how it affects our journey so we intersected through Laylee Hayslip. Laylee Hayslip has been a dear friend of mine for the last five to six years um, I connected with her as a part of my journey and a part of learning and a part of trying to share my story in a way that's going to help inspire others but it was just an email uh, connection about hey this is the new author that's coming out I want you guys to meet talk and everything like that and just like a chain reaction i mean i i, I felt like i was talking to a sister that i'd, I'd known all my life <laughs> uh so that that's how we met so after we met through email introduction through Laylee, uh we just started talking back and forth about what she's doing and what i'm doing with with not only intersections but the foundation the seacoast coast foundation with trying to get back and things just clicked um we just got along really well and you know i just found out about her book and uh, she wanted to send me a copy of it uh, a pdf copy of because she wanted my perspective on it. She wanted me to read it because from what I understand, one of her biggest fears was writing a book as a non amerasian because she's not amerasian but for seven years, for lack of a better term, she was embedded in that life with, with friendships and relationships with Amerasians that she had met along her journey in writing this book. So she was able to get a very good detailed uh, perspective from the Amerasians, their parents, these veterans and people that she um, talked to and researched during. So she sent me a PDF copy, and I can tell you, I planned on, I had to go down to Atlanta to visit my son um, a couple weekends ago, and my plan was just to read, read on the plane whenever I could, you know, whatever downtime, maybe take a month or two to, to, to read it. So we got down to Atlanta, and I started reading it one evening, um, and I marathon read through it. <laughs> I read through that entire book. It was uh, about 4.30 in the morning, and I can tell you that it was hard for me to differentiate between this being a fictional book and being somebody's real life story because there's so many details and so many nuances in that story that mirrored my own life and mirrored a lot of the experiences I've been through. There's, there's things and details about my journey that people don't know about. And it was, it was like she was reaching inside those experiences to be able to pull it out and help me come to grips with some of the issues that I'm dealing with as far as my identity as an Amerasian, as far as my feeling my whole life that I was abandoned at an orphanage and wondering why that was. Um, it, it was just amazing. And it also gave me a very good detailed look at what my life would have been like had I not been adopted. Mm. Uh, because I know that, you know, blessing of being adopted for me was a blessing. I know it's not for everybody, but for me, it was a blessing. The childhood I had and upbringing I had was an absolute blessing. But this book vividly goes into details of all the stories that I've heard. And I've heard stories about Amerasians that were left over that, that they were, they were, uh, they were abused, they were neglected, they were treated as they were called the dust of the earth. But been able to get in this book and hear from a pers first person perspective, from a fictional character, what life was like, I was like, oh my God, it broke my heart. I was like, this, this could have been me. This easily could have been me. This could have been my life here. And, and it really, I really appreciate that perspective because it gave me a new 
uh, motivation through as the director for the series to, to to pay more attention to these Amerasian stories and not just look at them as a another part of a story, but look them at go more in depth into it and find out what we can do to help them, what we can do to you know prevent this from happening in the future. I, mean, I, I know that's a big big order, but I think if we can understand, even if not not going through the experiences, we can understand through the works like this book and the perspective that she spent seven years being able to portray in a story like this, the way she wove them in. I was, just, I was blown away. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've read books. And I was like, I didn't put this book down for hours. I, I read through it in one night. No, it's a phenomenal book. Uh, and yeah. for somebody who reads, I read a lot. And mm -hmm. she, I went through the same experience you did, you know, and I'm, I'm that, you know, I, I, I don't relate obviously to the admiration or any of those journeys, but I can see the integrity of the work right. that she put into with the interviews and, you know, getting to know the subjects that she's writing about. Yeah. 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 It's very obvious. Like I said, when, when you're, when I'm reading through this book and I feel like I'm reading my own story and I'm having answers um, or questions answered that I've been afraid to ask of my own birth family, of, of my own upbringing, but the perspectives that she was able to give, one, and I'll just give you this one example was the relationship between the, um, the American service member and the Vietnamese woman. Um, I can honestly say I was born out of a romantic relationship. It wasn't one of those, you know, one and done things or, or, you know, God forbid any other tra traumatic action of war. I was actually born out of, the, out of a romantic relationship. And I knew this, and, you know, I've known this for the last, you know, seven years since I've known my birth parents alive, but to be able to get inside their head and understand and, and hear some of the parts of their story match up perfectly with what's going on with this couple in the book, I was like, wow, you know, it had me thinking, did she actually talk to my mom and dad? Because it sure sounds a lot like the, you know, the simulators are just, they're, they're, they're just insane, but it was really good. It was really good. So your journey to getting to know your mom and birth mom and dad seven years ago, what led up to that point where you started to search? It was having children of my own. Um, Cause I can tell you what I got out of law enforcement in 2001. I pursued a new career in, in photojournalism and now what I'm doing now. Um, and I pretty much ignored my history. Up to I, I still had no interest in knowing anything about Vietnam. I had zero interest in knowing anything about my ethnicity. I was at the point in my life where I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't denying it anymore. If anyone asks, I'm telling you I'm half Vietnamese, half, you know, half, half American, or however you want to put it. Um, so I wasn't denying that anymore. But after I had kids, it got me thinking. I'm like, you know what? I don't want these kids to get to an age and ask me questions about where I'm from or where they're from and me not have answers. So back in 2010, is when I started going online and doing some research and trying to find out. And it all started with a simple Google search for Sacred Heart Orphanage, because I knew that's where I was from. And from that, I was able to find some photos that one of the um, Marines that served over there had taken and had posted online. And it's just like a chain reaction. So 2010 is when my journey actually started. Uh, but it wasn't until 2017 uh, when my world was completely flipped upside down and inside out and completely took a turn for the turn tur tur for in a way that I never ever expected. The next question is, yeah, why 2017? What triggered yeah. that turn? Okay, this is funny but true story. I'll try to get short. Um, this, is a is, this is a podcast, Kirk. You don't need to keep it short. We okay, I got you. I got you. Okay, you don't need to All be right. concise. You need to drag yeah. out it so we can we can live and you. breathe every detail that you're about to say because this is special. I got you. It's a very special thing. I got you. Okay, so I've always known that half of me was Vietnamese. The other half was big question mark. Had no idea. Um, so one of the things about me is I, I have very dark skin in the summertime. I get very dark. Um, loved everything about the ocean. Loved surfing. Loved fishing. Loved being on the boat. Loved being on the beach. Uh, and I went to Hawaii uh, once to visit. And after that trip in Hawaii, I was like, you know what? I, that that lifestyle suits me. I just I don't know anything about my other half. I don't have Vietnamese. So in the true spirit of adopting, I'm just going to adopt Hawaii as my other half or Polynesian. So, you know, I, I jokingly and joked with my wife, you know, all the time, you know, I know I'm happy to me. The other half's got to be Hawaiian, you know, hang loose. You know, that's, that's who I am. I got the Ohana tattoo and everything uh, and, and all that. So that was kind of the running joke between that was the kind of the running joke between the two of us, because um, she didn't think I was half Hawaiian. She thought I was half Filipino. She's she's Filipino herself. And she thought by looking at my features and, you know, being raised by her Filipino father, she thought that I was half Filipino. So that was kind of a back and forth thing between us. Well, in 2017, early 2017, she said, hey, Kirk, 
you need to take a DNA test. Let's figure this out. Let's settle this. Let's settle this bet. And I was like, I'm not doing it. I'm not paying 150 some dollars for a DNA test. That's ridiculous. I'm not doing it. Didn't care. I, I was like, you know, I'm claiming Hawaii. That's all I need to know. Well, about two weeks later, I was at work and a little ad popped up as, you know, these things mysteriously happen. I got a Groupon ad for 50% off family tree DNA. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. So ordered the test kit, decided I was going to put this bet to uh, this bet to rest. Um, I don't even remember what the wager was. There's something silly like a free dinner. You know, we take each other out to dinner. But if I was wrong, I was going to have to take her out to dinner. If she was wrong, she had to take me out to dinner. So it was uh, in April of 2017, I put the test in. Okay, you fast forward about... It was almost exactly 29 days. I can't remember the exact number of days, but it was on May 19th, 2017. I was in Tennessee uh, for my middle son's graduation. He's graduating from high school. And I had uh, my other two sons with me. Now, my wife and my daughter were still, still back home in Virginia because she had just had a surgery and wasn't able to travel. So my wife and my daughter were in, Tennessee, or in Virginia, and then me and my two sons went to go visit my other son who was graduating high school. So we're in his graduation and I've got my phone on me uh, like everyone does. And I get this email and I look at the email and on the subject line, it says looking for my son. So I said, okay, I looked at the name, the name, the first name was NGA and the last name was uh, Niblet. And I remember looking at it thinking, wow, that's, that's a really weird name. But I thought NGA, I thought this was a African name. And the reason I thought it was African, you're laughing when I say this, is because of the movie um, Finding Schmidt with um, uh, Jack Nicholson. He had a pen pal named Ndugu. So I'm looking at this thing, okay, African name, weird last name, looking for my son. This is a scam. I was like, this is a scam. I didn't even read the rest of it. It said, looking for my son, please call me. I didn't read the rest of it. I was like, okay, this is clearly a Nigerian prince who's got millions of dollars that wants me to hold it for a small commission, the whole thing. So I ignored it. I was like... But the funny thing was I didn't delete it. Normally when I get, you know, spam or email like that, you know, I just delete it right away. So I put my phone down and graduation still going on. This is in the middle of graduation, mind you. Now, my son has not gone across the stage yet. And about five minutes later, I get another email. Now I look at it and it's from Family Tree DNA. And it says, test results, parent, child, match found. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, what? So I'm like, there's no way. So anyway, I clicked it. I clicked it and opened the email. And the name on the parent is... NGA. Nibble. I'm like, oh, whoa. I'm like, wait a minute. This isn't an African name. This is a Vietnamese name. And it says parent, child, match, mother. And I'm and I'm sitting there, you know, obviously kind of shocked. I'm like, this may not be a scam. I'm like, but I don't know how this is possible. She's dead. Her and my father were killed during the war. That's what I believe my whole life. Uh, so you can imagine my attention span at that time was completely shot. So I put the phone, had a force. Myself, put the phone down, go through my son's graduation. Um, and then after graduation, I explained to all my sons what was going on. And I said, look, I got these two weird emails back to back. I said, but there's a small possibility um, that my birth mother shall alive. And by that time, I had already texted my wife and my daughter and told them, hey, this is what's going on. Can you Google this name and find out what's going on? I'm still in graduation. I can't leave yet. So while I'm finishing up the graduation, they're Googling this name. And they found out while I was sitting there that, this is a Vietnamese woman who had been searching for her son for the last 40 plus years. Oh, my God. Yeah. She had put in a DNA test two years prior to me. She had gone back to Vietnam in 2015 looking for me, thinking I never got out. So um, I still my mind was still trying to process everything. And there's still a part of me thinking this is a scam. This is just really this is a really sick scam. I'm not sure what's going on here, but this is messed up. But there's a phone number on here on this email. And I told my son all of a sudden, Austin, I said, look. I'm going to call this number. I'm going to put it on speakerphone, but I want you to record this. I said, for one or two reasons. Number one, either this is one of the you know worst, harshest scams anyone could ever do. And I want you know evidence in case this you know Yahoo can ever be prosecuted. I said, or two, this is the real deal. And I want to have this on, on tape. You know, with me being a photojournalist, you know, photojournalism background, I'm all about documenting. So I actually recorded the phone call. And it took all of about 10 minutes on that phone call for us matching up details about who we were and where we were at the time in the war and everything, that it all made sense. And it was at that time, it was just like lightning. Like, Bam, holy crap, this is my mother. So in the course of that phone call, not only did I realize that I found my mother, my mother found me and that she was still alive, I also learned that in 20, 2015, my half-brother on my mother's side, it would have been her son, his name is Jimmy, but he's my half-brother on my mother's side, he had found out 
from my mom as well that I existed. So he started searching the military records and doing what he could to find my birth father because they had this idea in their mind that possibly he'd gone back to Vietnam and adopted me, brought me back to the United States. He wasn't even sure if he even knew I existed. So in 2015, he found my birth father through military records up in Syracuse, New York, who was alive and well, and gave him a call and dropped the bomb on him because he had no clue that I even existed. <laughs> so in the course of this one phone call, I found out that my birth mother's alive my birth father's alive, and I've got brothers and sisters on both sides that I didn't know existed. Uh, so that's why, as I said earlier, all of a sudden my world completely turned upside down. So um, it, it was an amazing journey. It's been an amazing journey. It's been a lot of blessings, and that's you know kind of the whole preface of why we started this foundation and wanted to do what we could to try to help other people, um, you know, who are in our situation to be able to navigate what it's like to go on this journey, what to expect. Um, you know, the ups and downs, because one of the things we did find, it's not all puppies and rainbows. You know, there's a lot of challenges. Anytime you throw a hand grenade into the nucleus of what you knew as a family, it's explosive. <laughs> you know, some good, some bad. So that's kind of in a nutshell how everything in 2017 changed. You were asking about it. That, that's what happened. Thank you for opening up and, and telling me about it. I'm now yeah. I have like a thousand questions that we're going to open it up sure. for. Yeah, if, yeah, absolutely. And if you're ever uncomfortable with telling the story, just let me know. You know, I, I feel uncomfortable. I don't want to go in that sure, sure, direction. Sure, sure. So you get this 10 minutes with your birth mother. Uh, wow, what is emotionally going on in your mind? Are you crying? Are you stunned? What's going on? I was too stunned to really be feeling anything. It, it was, I'm trying to think. It actually hit me the next day when we were on our way back to Virginia, you know, in the car because we drove. It was a long car ride. And I'm, well, that's a long time to sit and think. And it hit me. I'm like, oh, my God, that that was my birth mother. <laughs> you know, I just it's absolutely insane. And it's just being able to talk to her just for that short amount of time. And we talked. I talked again the next day. It's I feel like I'm talking to somebody I've known my whole life. I didn't feel like I was talking to a stranger. And that's one of those things I'd always heard my whole life about um, the, the biological connection that a, that a child has with their parent. And I never experienced that till I had my own kids. But for me to experience that with my own mother, that was just that blew my mind. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. Like I said, like I said earlier, the, the upbringing I had and the adoptive parents I had were absolutely amazing. They, they were, you know, they, they provided me with more opportunity and more blessings than, you know, most kids my age ever could have had. Uh, but there was always that lack of connection, um, lack of parental bonding that I didn't know existed. You know, it was one of those things I'd, I'd heard about it. You know, I, I thought maybe it was just one of those myths and unicorns that other people chase and can find, but until I was able to talk to my adopted mother and we were able to share intimate details of what our lives have been like for the last 50 years, for the first time in my life, I felt a parental bond. And that was pretty amazing. Um, and then when when did you get to meet her? Where did she live? Where did you live at the time? Yeah, I was, I was living in Virginia Beach at the time. I live in Norfolk now, which is right next door to Virginia Beach, just right up the road. Uh, and she was living in a little town called Center Point, Texas, which is just, just north of San Antonio. Um, so it was a couple of weeks later, her and my, I guess it'd be my stepfather, her husband, drove up to Virginia to meet me and the family for the first time. And what was that like? Oh, God. Honestly, and I've said this before, and, and I'll stick to this, it felt like an out-of-body experience because when it was happening, I literally felt like I was on the outside watching it happen. I, you know, my mom getting out of the truck and hugging for the first time or thanking God is just, the emotion there is just so strong. I literally felt like I was watching it from the outside. It was, and I mean that in a good way. It's an amazing feeling to be able to do that. Um, one of the other blessings we had was CBN had caught wind of what was happening, and we're actually there on hand to be able to record and do a story on on the first time we ever met. So that that's that, that was actually called a video, which is pretty awesome. Um, but it's, I don't know, words, words can't describe it. You know, you, you go for almost forty eight years of my life. Yeah, it was almost forty eight years of my life, thinking that this woman was dead. The woman that gave birth to me was dead. And thinking that she gave you up, you know, if she didn't die, she probably just dropped me off the orphanage because you've heard the stories, you know, yeah. Um, not knowing what she did for a living, what she, you know, how I was born, the circumstances I was born. There was all these questions, you know, that had been put into my mind by what I knew about the Vietnam War, the history, the movies, which were very derogatory in many cases about Vietnam, getting these women. Uh, but to be able to have those those uh, spaces filled with with the real story, the fact, and, and everything else was just it was crazy. It was amazing. It's you know, it took forever to come off that high. <laughs> it really did. Can, can I ask why she gave you up? And it, was it very different from what you had thought? 
growing up? Yeah, well, you know, like I said, initially, I, I thought she was dead. You know, I, I, there, there was never anything that said your parents are dead, but it was, I go back to what my adoptive father said, the chances are that they were both killed in the war. That's why they're the orphanage. But then as you grew up and you started hearing, you know, stories and these movies about, you know, the women that did what they had to do to be able to survive, that gave their kids away, that, you know, happened quite a bit. Um, whether it was a matter of survival, a matter of shame, I don't know. Um, one of the things I have to remember was it was a time of war. So it's it's nothing I would ever hold any animosity about. But yeah, there were several times in my life growing up where I had that thought, you know, I wonder if she's still alive or if she really didn't die. Did she not love me? Did she just give me away? Was she a prostitute? Was she raped? Was she in a relationship? It's all these different possibilities. And of course, as a kid, you always want to have that best case scenario. You don't ever want to think, oh, you know, she was raped and that's how I was born. Uh, because I've, I've met some adoptees. That's how they they know that's how they were conceived. And, and that's heartbreaking. Um, but to grow up your whole life not knowing, having that empty space there not knowing, is a lot more challenging than people realize when you don't know where you came from, when you don't know the origins. But having those spaces filled was 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 amazing. You know, and that's that's what led to the chain reaction of everything we're doing here today with intersections, with the foundation is trying to help other people fill those voids and to be able to live in the light of being Vietnamese and proud of. Now, what about your dad, your biological dad? Biological dad, that was um, it was interesting. The first, the first phone call I had with him, loved him to death, loved him to death. Uh, first phone call I had with him, one of the first things he wanted to know was, what did I want? <laughs> um, he wanted to know what? He wanted, he said, what do you want from me? <laughs> it, what? It was like, that was like the first question? Exactly, exactly. That was like, well, it was weird because um, I can't remember where I saw the, there, there was something I saw, I can't remember, it was a, a document or a nightline or something like that where, there was this false perception to adoptees and admirations coming from Vietnam that they felt like that everybody owed them something, which I've, I've never felt that way. I've never seen that. I've never seen that. But um, evidently, there was this false narrative out there that if they're from Vietnam or especially if they're Amerasian and they made it over in the, you know, as part of the Amerasian Homecoming Act, that they're expecting a handout. So, you know, when I talked to him and the first thing he's want to know is what I want from him, it just kind of caught me off guard because it was opposite from what my mom, you know, my mom was all, you know, my son, I love you, love you. But over the next few years, uh, we did connect. We did it. We're able to, uh, to connect and, and form a really good bond. Wait, um, how, what, what did you say to him when he asked you that? I said, I want absolutely nothing but a relationship. I just want to know who you are, and I want to know the story. I said, I know. I, I said, I heard mom. You know, I was joking. I said, I heard mom's side, but I got to hear your side. <laughs> you know. So, um, you know, he was relieved. He he, he let up after that, but I could tell he was real standoff show at that point. Which, you know, I can't say that I blame him. Can you imagine? Yeah. You know going that long, not even realizing you have a child and then yeah. get a phone call that you've got a child that's 40 some years old and you're already married and have kids of your own within, with, you know, with, with your wife. I could, I could imagine that. That's, you know, that's gotta be like dropping an atom bomb in that thing. Yeah, it's <laughs> trippy. But, um, but so he did have an established family and kids and everything. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, um, after he served Vietnam, he came back and he joined the uh, United States Postal Service and he worked for them for a little over 40 years. And that's a whole other story. I gotta tell you, he worked with them for a little over 40 years and then uh, retired and had kids of his own. So I've got uh, two half, no, three half brothers and a half sister on my father's side. Uh, I've met my sister. I've met uh, my two brothers. My oldest brother I haven't met yet. There's issues with dynamics there that I won't get into, but I haven't met him yet. But um, yeah. Anyway, and then on my mom's side, I've got a, a half sister and a half brother on my mother's side. But your your dad's wife and family, I mean, they that was literally like an atom bomb dropped on to the family. Oh yeah, yeah, it was. Um, and I'll be very open and candid with you about this. And um, yeah, I don't think I'll regret sharing this, but I, but I think it needs to be shared because I think adoptees need to understand, especially adoptees that found their parents, what they can expect. Um, I was never accepted by my my dad's wife. Uh, she passed away a couple of years ago, and then uh, my, adopt, my my birth father passed away last year. So I, I do know that you know my father told me she had referred to me as his bastard son, didn't want to know me, didn't want to meet me, didn't want to know anything about me. Um, so there was that dynamic there. Um, and one of the other things that happened that was really crazy is uh, I told you I've got two brothers and a sister on my father's side. Well, I have a brother who's two years younger than me who's who's uh, mentally impaired. He's intellectually challenged. He's got autism. And um, I wasn't allowed to see him. I wasn't allowed to meet him. 
And the first time I got to meet him and, and see him, my little brother for the first time ever was at my father's funeral last year. That's the first time I got to meet him. Um, but the crazy thing is, and this, and this is one of the things I think that adoptees need to understand that if they are starting to reconnect with birth families, um, how strong that bond can be. Because I will share with you that after my father died, on my father's side of the family, there was not the ability for anyone to take him in. He had lived with my adoptive father, or I'm, I'm sorry, he had lived with my birth father and his mother his entire life, unable to take care of himself. And nobody could take him in or would take him in over here. So he ended up coming to live with me, my wife, and my family. He's been living here since uh, last April and doing wonderfully. He's doing really good. But it was one of those things where I'm hearing this conversation back and forth between my brother and some cousins. Well, what are we going to do with Brian? He's going to go in a group home. Well, he's not going to live past two years in a group home. He'll never go to spot. I'm sitting there going, guys, he's my brother. I got room. He come live with us. So Brian has been living here and doing a wonderful job. He, he, he loves it here. Um, but the only reason I share that is I want people to understand that are looking for a birth family and, and if they have the blessing of finding them, that there could be some curses and there could be some downside to it too. Because like I said, I was referred to as, as the bastard child of my father <laughs> by someone who's never met me and didn't want to give me the time of day to the point that I wasn't even allowed to meet my brother until after they passed away. But, uh, anyway, that's, that's just one of the, the stories I want to share with you. God, can you imagine? You know. If she had known that you would take in her son, how much regret she would feel? Yeah, yeah. But the important thing is he's taken care of. Like I said, yeah, he's my brother. <laughs> you know, he's had my half brother. He's you know we're blood, and I, I will never ever take family for granted. That's one of the things I've learned on this journey. You know, your family don't ever ever take it for granted, yeah. no matter yeah. how you know. And and how did your relationship with your father grow over time? Because he was very skeptical, skeptical, and his wife was like not really about this. How did you build the the relationship to get it tighter? Because the first thing you said is, "I love the guy," right? Yeah, yeah. So you're very fond of whatever happened. So, you know, I I want to know like what happened. How did it escalate into something deeper? Well, he he came down to visit a few times. That, you know, his wife didn't come with him obviously <laughs> but he came and stayed with us a few times for a few weeks and then when i'd go up there i would stay with my other brother and he'd come stay with us out there so we spent a lot of time together and what's what's i think one of the things that helped is we got the same weird sense of humor mm -hmm. i mean just you know i've got a very dry I, as i've heard some people refer to it as the dad humor you know i tell yeah. dad jokes all the time that i think are funny or anything and everyone like, you know, when I tell a joke, my kids just look at me with this blank stare. I know it's a great joke. <laughs> <laughs> so we just had a lot in common as far as the way we, we looked at life, as far as the way we handled adversity. Um, even though that his, you know, his wife didn't want anything to do with me and have animosity towards me, he didn't let that affect his relationship with me. But at the same time, he didn't force me down her throat. And that's kind of the way I am, too. I'm, I'm very laid back. I'm very, you know, let people go at their flow. Let them, you know, accept things at a pace that's comfortable with them. Let them process things in their own terms, that's the same way I am. And, and he's the same way. So there was a lot of uh, personality um, parallels there. I think we just hit it off because we're so much alike. Um, and I, I'll share this story with you because I was talking about the humor. Remember I shared with you that um, he joined the post office and yeah. he was with the post office. Well, after he passed away, uh, he was cremated. And um, for reasons I'm not going to get into, nobody wanted his remains. I had already come back to Virginia, no one his remains. So I called up the funeral home and said, hey, look, my dad deserves a proper final resting place. Send his remains to me and I will take care of it. I'll make sure that he gets a proper, you know, proper burial, get taken care of properly. So a few months later, dad arrives in the mailbox delivered by the U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you can't make stuff like this up, man. It's like he worked for them for 40 years, retired from them, and his remains are shipped to me in a box that says U.S. Postal Service cremated remains in my mailbox. I'm like, Oh my gosh, that this is just is hilarious. the craziest thing. So got his remains, and then this last January, I, I was able to get permission from the Vietnamese government, which I was told I would never do. This is one of the things I'm talking about. They're, they're awesome. Uh, to take a portion of his remains over to Vietnam. So I spread half of his ashes over there in the Nang Bay, and then when it warms up here, I'm going to take them out on the Atlantic Ocean, spread the rest of it out here on the Atlantic Ocean. To me, it was just, it's just fitting because I live here, and because you know the relationship with his mother, or my mother and him, was a romantic one and he loved Vietnam and loved the people. I just figured that was a fitting final resting place for him. Now, 
Did your adoptive parents ever meet your biological parents? No, 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 unfortunately they didn't. Um, and that, that, that's, that's another challenge that I, I will always want to present to adoptees that are on this journey. It may not always turn out well. My adoptive parents didn't want to meet them. Um, they perceived, very, very grossly misperceived the discovery of my mother as me trying to replace my family. Um, I, I can't understand where that mentality comes from or why they had the mentality, but there was not any, uh, any any happiness from my adoptive family. Even to now, has it been repaired? No, no. Well, my, my adoptive mother passed away two years ago, and my adoptive father, he still lives in um, Texas with my uh, little sister who was adopted with me, who whole other story. I told you she was adopted with me. She was an infant, and they didn't realize at the time that she was suffering from mental impairment as well. I, they think that was attributed to malnutrition. So she's lived with my adopted parents my whole life. She still lives with me. She's sweet as can be. She's two. She's also two years younger than me, same as my uh, brother Brian. Last year. Um, now, yeah, they, 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 they've not been open to it. Uh, I know my, my birth mother had even written a, a thank you card and, and we'll thank them for giving me the life they had. And the ironic thing is they live less than an hour away from each other. You know, my, my adoptive parents live in New Braunfels, Texas, which is less than an hour away from Center Point. So for 20, 20 plus years, they live within an hour of each other. Uh, but, you know, I, I can honestly say my birth mother made attempts to try to connect with them, at, to show them gratitude and thank them, but they never reciprocated. And you know, it's but, unfortunate. But, but you were still close awesome. to your adoptive parents? No. <laughs> yeah. And that's part of the reason why, you know, and, and I, I'll be honest with you, a lot of that is because of, of bad decisions I made growing up when it comes to, you know, relationships. You know, and I'm talking year, decades ago, mm. you know, when it comes to some relationships and, and some financial decisions I made. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of disappointment with my adoptive parents and me. And rightfully so. I claim it. I own it. That's my own mistakes. I made yeah. those mistakes. Uh, but because of those mistakes, I had been estranged from them for, for, for quite some time. Got uh, it. So, that, I guess that kind of led them to the mindset as Kirk found his parents, he must have been trying to replace us since we're estranged. Oh, that makes that sense. was kind of fed, fed by some family members, unfortunately, that helped them buy into that. But um, You know, yeah. the world and, and our lives are so complex. And it reminds me as I hear this, how similarly complex the history of the Vietnamese people is mm -hmm, in the last mm -hmm. 50 years. Because... Yeah. We can't paint with broad strokes good and bad. We can't really say your adopted parents were bad people or, you know, um, the wife of your biological father was a bad person. There's all these like motives and these pieces that are part of the conversation that if we take time to get to know, we can have compassion for people and let people just be because not everything will change people's hearts and minds. And I think that hearing stories like yours and the complexity of it, it's just really uh, a micro way of looking at the big, big picture of a country like Vietnam versus the US and the complexities, because there was a lot of wonderful, beautiful things that came out of that war. And yeah. obviously there's a lot of death and destruction that came out of it as well. I'll boil down to one word. One word changes everything. It's misperception. You know, it's misperception. People misperceiving the motives, misperceiving this, misperceiving that. And not only that, but then not having the heart or the openness to be open to anyone's yeah. perception but your own. And I, and I think that that is the biggest thorn in any side when it comes to trying to deal with the issues with adoptees and Vietnam and Amerasians is just misperception. I think that, that one word sums it up. That's like the human condition is what mm -hmm. we're conditioned to see certain things and now we're not able to let go of certain perceptions and we misperceive because we are so baked in the way we think and, mm -hmm. and it's really a lack of communication or being open to communicate because i mean if i was your uh i'm, I'm obviously theorizing beautifully mm -hmm. yeah. heavenly things but if i was your adoptive parents i would take time and sit to get to know this Vietnamese woman who had the the child that I raised for all these years you know I wanted to get to know mm -hmm. her I want to what was her journey like for her to drop off this baby you know I would 
as an adoptive parent, I'd be like, let me put everything aside. Let me just get to know this woman and then really get to know why her son, I mean, naturally would want to get to know his mother, biological yeah. mother, yeah. you know, yeah. but we have all these fences and these, you know, walls that we put up because we can't deal with the truth and it hurts. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I think part of it made to uh, be generational too, you know, because my adoptive parents grew up in a different time than we did. There wasn't yeah. a whole lot of, um, you know, especially with my father being a career army officer, there's not a whole lot of outward affection that he shows to anybody. Right. You know, you, know, you know, he loves you. You know, he's proud of you. You know, he wants best for you, but he never verbalized. So, you know, that's just kind of a generational thing, I think, because not just with the military, I think parents in general, when you think back on that generation, the, I think, I don't want to say the baby boomers might have been the generation before that, but there just wasn't a whole lot of connection as yeah. far as affection between parent and child. And, and I've heard that before because I know one of the things I've always struggled with my whole life um, in, in talking with friends and family and now adoptees is, why did I never feel that bond with my parents? Why was there never that strong connection? And what I found was a lot of friends that I've got that weren't adopted, that were raised by their biological parents, had the same issues. And we kind of figured, well, it's because they're the same age. It's because it was a generational thing. It was nothing to do well, with adoption. Right. Not the entire generation, but there's a certain group within that generation where, you know, physical and, you know, outward affection shows displays affection weren't a thing. Even though you knew they loved you, they never showed it. Yeah. Now, is your uh, birth mother still alive? Oh, yeah. She's alive and well. She came oh, back to Vietnam with us this last time we went to go oh. film in January. She came with us uh, to be part of the, the uh, series, be interviewed, and also serve as an interpreter. She's what, what's I had that? half her energy. You say alive and well, that's another statement. She's got twice as much energy as I got. I don't know where she gets it. <laughs> and what's, what's she like? And what's your relationship with her like? It's got to be way different than anything that you experience because this is your birth mother. And... Mm -hmm. That, that relationship has to be like, I, I can imagine a thousand times warmer than anything you've ever felt. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. But one of the things I, I've learned with her and, and from what I was saying is um, Vietnamese culture, especially we're talking about generations and, and how generations kind of uh, they're, they're, they're societal norms. She's very, very open and blunt about what she's thinking. And I have found that with several Vietnamese women that are her age, are, are family members that they're not afraid to tell you what's on their mind. All of and, them. And, and sometimes with, you know, the American mindset of trying to be, you know, politically correct and proper and all that, sometimes you got you got to sit back and wonder, okay, well, does she really mean that or is she just speaking her mind? And, you know, it took a while for me to kind of get uh, – abrasiveness is not the word I would use, but it was definitely forthright. The way she thinks, the way she talks, uh, and she's never, ever afraid to voice her opinion right or wrong. And she'll even tell you, I might be wrong, but this is how I feel about it. <laughs> so I think that's been – actually a blessing because it's it's refreshing to be around someone who is not only bi biologically connected to me, but is not afraid to tell me what they're thinking, what they're feeling, you know, what they see, what what they perceive. Because not only does it give me a, a look into her mindset and, and what she's gone through and what she's going through, it gives me the opportunity to clear any misperceptions she might have about my life and who I am and vice versa. So I've learned to be a lot more forthright and, and open with others in my life and it's been met with, you know, varying results, but uh, I have found through my mother just in this, you know, short seven years since I've known her that, you know, you need to be open and honest and, and very forthright with people, especially when it comes to matters that are important. Uh, you, can, you can't, you can't tiptoe around it. <laughs> so that that's one of the things I've learned about her. But her energy level, I just, I, I don't know where she gets it. She's, you know, 17 years older than me, and. Where she gets her energy, I wish I could just bottle that and keep it. <laughs> I'd and be a lot more productive if I could. And how did she get out of Vietnam? What was her journey like being uh, ending up here in the U.S.? Oh, wow. Um, I don't want to speak for her because I don't want to miss all the details. But I, I do know that after after I was born and I was taken away from her and put in the orphanage, um, and she couldn't find me. The reason she couldn't find me, I've got to tell you that little detail. But when my uncle took me to the orphanage, they had my name changed. So she, when she went to the orphanage, and she was looking for Tran Von Hung, which was what my birth name was. I wasn't there because they had my name changed to, to Wien Viet Hong when they put me in there. So she went to the orphanage looking for me. The nun said, well, he's not here. And she gave up after that point until she got back to the United States. But after that happened, she she fell in love with another service member uh, who was serving over there and ended up marrying him. And she got she actually came to the United States uh, after marrying him before I, I got adopted. So she's been in the United States longer than I have. 
Wow. So she's fluent in English and in all of it. Yep. Yep. She's very fluent in English and still very fluent in Vietnamese. Yep. Uh, it's heartbreaking, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's heartbreaking to to know that you left your kid back there. I mean, that probably. Do you yeah. ever talk about how much that weighed on her? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just about every time time we uh, we're together, she talks about it. You know, it's just you know, and especially now as a father, I can imagine. I could not, no, could not imagine being separated from my child for any length of time, much less almost forty eight years. That's just. And, you, and I, you, honestly, you think, mind that. I honestly think for men, it's probably a lot easier to like let go. Yeah. You know? But for women, that piece of you is coming out of you physically. Yeah. That yeah. child comes out of you physically. That's your literally your connection. Uh, and yeah. I think men are a little bit more. They're probably a little bit. Yeah. I think you and I are the same. We, 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 you know, we are very, very close to our, our children, yeah. but yeah. I can't imagine being a woman being that close and always thinking about your, your son. Exactly. Like I said, even as a father who didn't bear him, I can't imagine how much more it must be for a mother because I could never imagine losing one of my kids. Ever. Yeah. And, and to be a, a mother who actually carried it. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how she did it. You know, that just, that to me speaks volumes to what, what, you know, how strong of a character she was. Do you ever catch yourself overcompensating love with your children oh. to the point where it's damaging oh. or, or just downright hurt, hurting your child because you've yeah. just wanting to give more than you received or whatever that was? Man, that's the story of my life. <laughs> Not <laughs> just with, yeah, especially with my kids, but that's been the story of my life through friendships, through uh, professional career development. And even into to parenthood, but yeah, um, and I, I'm also relieved to know after meeting several adopters, talking to them, I'm not the only one. But yeah, we, we, I find myself overcompensating a lot, you know, just trying to give them. And I don't want to say everything that I never had because I had everything, but I don't ever want them to feel that sense of emptiness like I did. Yeah. Even though my my sense of emptiness was never material, because like I said, I wrote, I, I was raised in a very good family, and had everything in the world I would ever want, but my emptiness is what I, I lacked and I didn't ever want my kids to feel that way. So, you know, with, with, with the career I've got and, and, and the life that we give our family, my wife and I give our family, they don't have material uh, needs either, but they do have that emotional need. So I find myself overcompensating with the emotional needs. <laughs> so, um, yeah, cause yeah, I, I, yeah. I was just guessing that because I mean, I've never read any literature on that or I was just putting myself in your shoes going, after all these years, you have this wonderful family. Yeah, there's yeah. got to be some like need to like do more than you received, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. There, there always is, and and that's the thing with being adopted too. Is as a kid growing up, you've always gotten that back in your mind. You know, I was given up for adoption once. What if I screw up bad enough, or I'm not good enough for this family to keep me? Damn. So you overcompensate for things like that. Um, and, and and I was talking about in the professional world. I can tell you. Um, I could be miles, 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 light years ahead where I am at in my career had I not put other people first. And that's just who I am. I've always tried to put other people first, try, try to please people, try to overcompensate to the point that I'm trying to, you know, help other people out to the point that I neglect my own career progress. So, you know, it's, it's in a personal and a professional aspect. I have found my entire life that I'm always overcompensating, always trying to uh, give so much of myself that I forget who I am and I lose myself in the process. This intersection docu series getting into can is a massive deal. It's a big deal. Uh, can you get, tell me? Can you give me details of like how you got started with filmmaking and all the way up until getting into can? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it started about three years ago when I started on this journey and I started meeting all these different people. And one of the people I happened to meet was, like I told you, Lady Hayslet. Um, I met her. That was as a result of a uh, 2019 People Magazine article that they did on my my life story uh, in November of 2019. It was National Adoption Month, so I I was in the magazine. Um, my life story was in there, and as a result of that, just through connections, Layla and I connected, and she was fascinated by my story, wanted me to come out and visit her. She's like, "Oh, I feel like I know you already. Come out and visit me." So I literally got on a plane, flew out to Escondido to meet her, and. Uh, while I was there, I met a, uh, a filmmaker who was um, works at Palomar College who'd done a documentary on Laylee 20-some years ago. 
And we had talked about my story and the story of some other adoptees that I had met and about doing a little documentary on it. So we kind of embarked on that little journey. It was going to be a documentary. It's just going to be a, a feature length documentary. Um, and then two things happened. Uh, the other two adoptees decided that wasn't the right for the, fit for them and dropped out of the project. And then COVID happened. So about three to four months before we were going to go back to Vietnam to film, everything got shut down. Everything got canceled. Everything just completely shut down. So unfortunately, that, that documentary filmmaker um, had to scrap the project because the people he asked to answer to wasn't going to wait around for two to three years to figure out what happened. So after that happened, I still realized, you know, there's still a story here. And I'd already been connected with several other adoptees, some who were in the same orphanage with me at the same time, which is insane. And I was like, you know what? There's there's too many stories here to, to ignore this. This is just too big. And, I, you know, I had gone to school and got my degree in photojournalism and I'd worked with Fox News for some time. So I knew I had a background of being able to tell stories. And um, that was my passion. That's my passion is telling stories through documentaries, through through news stories, uh, when I worked, worked for Fox News, you know, what limited time I had, I could tell stories. So I just decided, you know what, instead of doing a a, a feature length documentary on one or two lives, we need to do a series because there are so many people that we're coming connection with that there's no way you can fit the enormity of five or six stories in a one hour. There's no way you can do it. So, you know, fast forward, we just, it was a chain reaction. We went from having five or six people whose stories we wanted to share, they wanted to share to, we've got over 70 people now who are in line waiting to have their story told. And each one of them are unique. Each one of them have something different for their story, something that can help another person. That's the most important thing is we wanted to be able to help people. Because I told our, our film crew when we first embarked on this project, I said, look, guys, here's the deal. I want to do this docuseries. I want to be able to share these stories because I know the blessings I've had. I want to be able to pay that forward and I also want to be able to, you know, be a cautionary tale with some of the things that can go wrong in these journeys, like we've discussed. Uh, and I said, here's here's the thing, though. I don't care if this docuseries ends up being nothing more than a YouTube channel that we're putting these on that gets 20 views. I said, if it gets 20 views and it impacts one person's life and changes one person for the better and gives them some clarity in their life, to me, the mission is accomplished. If I can just help at least one person. So that's the mindset I sat on and that's the mindset I'm still on. So we started doing these docu series. It started growing. It's just the momentum started growing. And uh, last year we decided to go and take the pilot episode and submit it to several film festivals. So we did that. We're still in the running for I think nine more. Uh, we were accepted into the, the Cannes World Film Festival, and we were accepted into the uh, Docs Without Borders Film Festival. So in December we were selected as the uh, inspirational film, most inspirational film. Uh, nominated for uh, Best Director for Documentary, and then also um, the runner-up, the finalist for uh, Best Documentary. And then shortly after that, we got selected for the Docs Without Borders for a, for an excellent excellence award. So that's kind of where we're at right now. We still got uh, another four months left in, in the film festival circuit. And honestly, we're chomping the bit because we can't release it publicly until the film circuit's done. Film festivals are done because they have certain guidelines and rules about premieres that it can't be out in the public until they are done with all the judging. So once that gets done and hopefully we get the pilot out there, we can even start getting more, more, more momentum. But just from, you know, the people we've connected with, the trailers we've done, the social media marketing, we have had all these admirations and these adoptees finally realize, you know what? My voice is important. My story matters. I don't want my kids to wonder like I did, you know, who am I, where I come from? I want them to know. And many of them are doing it or wanting to share their story because they're, you know, they have the same heart that our film crew and, and I do. We want to help other people with this journey because there's going to be a lot of good and there's going to be a lot of bad. Like I said, this it's not always puppies and rainbows. I've met adoptees who found their birth parents and got rejected. You know, they found their birth father, birth father and family said, we don't have anything to do with you. We met adoptees who found their birth father. And the first time they ever got to visit them was at their gravesite because they were already dead. So we, you know, we always have to constantly remind people that this is a, a journey that has lots of different turns and intersections that may not always go the way you want. It's not always going to be that fairy tale ending. It's not always going to end up well. But if we can prepare them mentally for sharing our stories and prepare them emotionally for what they're going to feel going through that journey, then I think we've accomplished something. And like I said, it doesn't matter to me if it, you know, nothing more than a YouTube channel that, you know, few people look at. But if it can get on a larger scale, such as the Cannes, you know, World Film Festival and things like that, where it can have more of an audience, more of an impact. I'm all for that. Trust me. Uh, I'm all for that. If we can reach a broader audience and, and we can help more people because it's it, that's that's what the series is about. It's, it's helping people on their journey. It's helping them heal. It's helping them find their identity. And it's helping them 
prepared for the best and worst of what's going to come along with the journey. I believe that you are going to be in California on this book tour, part of this book tour with uh, Chi Nguyen Phan Quay Mai, correct? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what, what part of the leg of the journey are you coming out so we can, you know, let people know? Um, I will be out there for the um, the launching of the book signing at the found, the foundation. Valley, yeah, Fountain yeah. Valley event. I'll be there, and then um, I'm also going to be at the Los Angeles Public Library with her the next morning, uh, where she's doing a little book launch, and we'll talk there. Wonderful. So you're going to be here for two two days. Uh, the, the three days, yeah, three days total. I'll be uh, be flying in on. Actually, I'm coming in early because I, I don't want to be rushed. So I'll be flying in Saturday, and then I won't be leaving again until Monday, Monday night. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, so I will be seeing you at both of these events, which is oh, awesome, awesome. Good. March 19th uh, at 11 o'clock. I think tickets are almost sold out. Um, oh, that's awesome. That's good. That's good. By the time this releases, it's going to be sold out because I just checked in with uh, one of the organizers this morning, and we were getting some L.A. Uh, some Orange County teachers. Uh, that teach in predominantly heavy Vietnamese uh, students. Oh, nice, nice. Okay. okay. But it was good. just too, yeah, too late uh, to, to get everybody. Yeah. But those teachers bought tickets. And so uh, I'll see you that Sunday morning, and then I'll see you um, Monday night. I think uh, yeah. on Monday night I'll have some stage time with you. I'll be moderating um, our Q&A for Chikwe Mai at the LA oh, awesome. Library on okay. March 20th. Awesome. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah. Okay. Kirk, thank you so much. I um, thank you. It was a it was a very uh, heartfelt interview, and uh, I'm glad that things have turned out uh, the way they did for your life. Uh, it's a beautiful journey. Yeah, it's a blessing. Like I said, too many blessings to keep on myself. Got to pay them forward. Got to keep going. <laughs> yeah, and congratulations on being accepted to Cannes. That's a big deal. All right, thank you. I All appreciate right. it. We'll see you in a few days. All right, thank you. Hey, thanks, Kirk. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran. Special thanks to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcasts.